Chris Berry, president of House Mountain Partners, is back on Kitco to talk about EV batteries and the metals associated with the entire industry, base metals as well. Chris, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Great to be here, David. Very, very fast growing industry. Let's start by talking about the fastest growing metal within the EV space. That would be lithium. Uh, I like to call it the bell of the ball. Uh, the reason why it's growing so fast and why I think investors have really latched onto it is because it's probably the one battery metal, the only battery metal that is really not substitutable. Uh, this is called the lithium ion battery for a reason. You will see a number of different uh, chemistries, lithium ion battery chemistries sort of grow and perpetuate over the course of this decade, but they will all contain roughly the same amount of lithium, say out 10 years that they do today. And that's one of the reasons why I actually see the lithium market from a demand perspective growing at about a 20% compound annualized growth rate between now and 2030. So if we're at a 370,000 ton a year market today, or arguably at the end of 2020, that puts us well over a million tons of lithium demand by 2025 and 2 million tons by 2030. So this is a very small opaque industry that really has to adjust to this shock in a hurry to hit those demand projections. Wow, okay. Demand growing by 20% CAGR year over year. Okay, so what, uh, what is driving that demand? Is it purely the EV market? Presumably, yeah. if, 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 if uh, the lithium uh, metal itself is dry, it's growing by 20% CAGR, that means the uh, demand for electric vehicles you're projecting is growing by at least that. Well, or, yeah, the, that's correct. And, and the, I think the way to think about it is, look, lithium is not rare. This is one of the big misconceptions in the market, but producing large quantities, hunt tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of tons of battery grade material is really the challenge for the industry. Um, it is the lithium ion battery that is going to drive that growth. Of course, lithium is used in ceramics, it's used in greases, it's used in pharmaceuticals. But those other avenues of demand, as I call them, are going to grow at maybe global GDP. So, you know, two, three percent a year. Uh, but no, it's that 20 percent growth rate is really going to be driven, if you'll pardon the pun, by the battery demand, not just in mobility, but of course, I think in energy storage, at least initially as well. Okay. Well, uh, there is competition uh, for energy sources of uh, alternative energy sources for electric vehicles. Uh, hydrogen is popping up. Hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are popping up as an alternative. Elon Musk has uh, famously characterized hydrogen fuel cell vehicles as quote unquote stupid. Do you share his sentiment at all? I think he also called them fool cells, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> um, you know, I haven't done a lot of work in hydrogen, to be honest with you. My understanding is that even a hydrogen uh, fuel cell uh, or powered um, automobile is going to use even a small lithium ion battery. So, you know, there's probably a small market for hydrogen fuel cells uh, with respect to mobility. But really, when you think about lithium's track record, it's got uh, 30 plus years of use cases across um, handhelds, across automotive. So, you know, we know how it operates in a number of different environments. It's the lightest of all metals. And again, it's abundant. So, you know, that doesn't mean that there won't be booms and busts. That's certainly what we've seen just in the last 10 years. I think this is the third lithium cycle that I've been focused on in my career. So, you know, um, I just don't really see hydrogen taking very much market share from lithium at all anytime in the future. But what does that mean for investors? Because from what I understand, lithium is not a tradable metal. It's not, uh, it's not anywhere on an exchange or uh, it can't be, um, can't be tracked as an ETF. So how can we participate? Well, traditionally, what you have uh, investors have done is focused on the lithium miners themselves, companies like Albemarle, SQM, Genfang Lithium. I will say that because there is so much scrutiny, if this is the right way to think about it, on the lithium market from an ESG perspective, there's also been a real focus on pricing transparency. And so you've seen the London Metals Exchange, you've seen the Chicago Mercantile Exchange actually introduce lithium hydroxide futures contracts. And this is something that's very new, so it's a nascent market, but what it's designed to do is help in a sort of a hedging, from a hedging perspective, and also aid in reducing, I think, some of the volatility in this market. So it's a positive sign, but again, it's a really small, opaque market. We've got a ways to go, but we're going in the right direction. And what are the top countries in the world producing lithium right now? Well, you, lithium really comes from two primary sources, hard rock, which is originated, I guess, dominated 
by Western Australia. There are a number of mines over there. And of course, the Lithium Triangle, which is effectively where Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile converge, uh, is the main source, the secondary main source of, of lithium. And that, of course, comes from brine. And I think, you know, while sources of lithium, again, it's not rare. There are deposits in Europe. There are deposits in North America. I really think you're going to see um, Western Australia ramp and own the hard rock space. And you're also going to see, um, you know, the lithium triangle ramp their capacity as well. And I would say that probably the new entrants in the next few years are going to come from Argentina and Brazil in particular. Okay. Interesting. And what about the other metals associated with the EV ecosystem? It's not just lithium that's, uh, that's needed to produce an electric vehicle, of course. Sure. I mean, I think people default to lithium, cobalt, graphite, copper, and nickel. Those are sort of the big five, as I call them. You know, there's been a huge move in the market over the last few years to engineer cobalt out of batteries. But of course, cobalt is really crucial for higher energy density, or let's just say nickel-heavy cathodes. Um, it, it, it is effectively a stabilizing agent in the cathode and prevents or helps to prevent what's called thermal runaway, which is something we're unfortunately going to see more of in the future and that is effectively when the battery can short circuit and start causing a fire so mm -hmm. you know a lot battery chemistry i think and advances in battery chemistry are one of the areas that i think investors really want to think hard about over the next few years even though for example cobalt is going to become arguably less of a factor in the battery business you're still going to see the market perhaps double two and a half times larger by 2025 or later in the decade again because of the battery business all right, well, let's talk about the car business then. The, uh, one of the primary uh, demanders for were sectors demanding uh, the use of lithium. So if you're projecting, again, a really high compound annual growth rate for lithium, 20%, that implies a really high demand growth for electric vehicles. Does that mean that you are also bullish on the car sector as a whole? Do you think the auto industry is moving in the right direction for you, Chris? Yeah, they're moving in the right direction. Uh, you know, automotive manufacturing is a famously low margin business. And so that's why it's important for these automotive manufacturers, whether or not it's General Motors, Tesla, Neo over in China, three just very general examples. It's important for them to think about security of supply of the raw materials, lithium in particular. I mean, these companies need to be thinking about their supply chains and how they're going to grow on a more regionalized basis. And what they have to do is ensure that they can lock in not just six months of supply or one year of supply, but three to five to seven to maybe upwards of 10 years of raw material supply to manage the flow and also manage the price. Because again, automotive manufacturing is a famously sensitive business from a margin perspective. So it's gonna be really interesting to see who, who survives. Well, you had said that lithium is not in short supply. It's not very rare. So why is it important for automobile manufacturers to secure supply? Well, again, you're, you're right, you know, and I did say that lithium is not rare. You could extract it from seawater if the price ever got high enough. But what is rare and what is the challenge for the entire supply chain is securing not just six months or not just 12 months, but three to five to seven to 10 years of what's known as battery grade material. This is highly purified lithium. So again, finding it, not the problem. Mining it, also not the problem. But producing battery quality material so it can operate and you can actually get in your car, whether or not it's a Chevy Bolt or a Tesla or what have you, and drive, you know, 300, 400, 500 kilometers on a single charge. That all has to do and is focused on and centered on the purity of the raw materials, lithium in particular. And that's what keeps purchasing managers at automotive manufacturers up at night right now. I'm just thinking, are there subsectors revolving around the uh, lithium industry that we can invest in? For example, recycling, I'd imagine there's a lot of companies in the recycling business that would stand to profit. The more lithium batteries you produce, the more you'll need to either recycle it or uh, dispose of it. So how does sure, that absolutely. Work? Yeah, and you're absolutely right, David. I mean, I think one of the one of the differences today in the current lithium boom relative to years past is that ESG is an enormous focus. Uh, whereas it wasn't maybe issue number one uh, for the lithium miners or, or the, the supply chain overall. And so recycling is something that has actually just in the last few years become a serious focus for automotive manufacturers. Everyone's thinking about their own ecosystem and how to make it more circular. I mean, there are a lot of buzzwords out there around ESG. 
Um, but you know, the recycling business, interestingly enough, I don't think it's going to become a factor in terms of adding to lithium supply before maybe 2028 or 2030. What you're likely to see is a lot of battery scrap get, um, recycled between now and then. And the issue is that, again, coming back to what I said earlier about battery chemistry really changing and, and ramping up, these lithium ion batteries are now lasting 10 to 12 plus years. Um, they have a useful life of 500, 600, 700,000 miles. That's what we're sort of finding. And so what that means is that, yes, while batteries are going to need to be recycled because of you know the 200 plus gigafactories that are going to be pumping out all of these cells in the coming years, it's really not going to hit the market before later this decade. So you want to be thinking about it now and I think maybe investing or planning accordingly, where you, we're, we're, we're depending upon where you are on the supply chain. But, um, you know, it's not an issue today. Yeah. Pretty much everyone I've talked to, Chris, is bullish on the whole EV phenomenon. We talk about electric vehicles being the next biggest thing. Everyone's going to be driving a car, electric vehicle in 40, 50 years. It's already happening. Every single car manufacturer is making electric vehicles even Hummer. So this is obviously the trend. Let's talk about some headwinds. I like to understand some of the risks involved in this industry. Uh, what could possibly challenge the EV thesis? Well, I think, look, uh, it has been pushed forward thus far by a lot of, of government subsidies and largesse, for lack of a better phrase. Um, governments, I think, are looking at the EV supply chain with respect to decarbonization and using the carrot and the stick as, as the process to entice the supply chain to shift and also to entice investors, not investors, excuse me, but consumers to um, switch to, to electrified forms of transport. So the carrot obviously comes from the subsidies, whether or not that's here in the United States or the European Union, anywhere else for that matter. And, you know, the stick is really more focused on how governments are interacting with companies, for example, forcing companies in the Eurozone, uh, or I should say fining companies in the Eurozone based on the amount of CO2 their cars emit per kilometer driven. And so obviously the more energy dense or the more carbon intense your form of transport is, the more you're going to get fined. And so there is an incentive there to switch to cleaner electrified forms of transportation. So issue number one is governments can kind of stepping back and, and getting rid of the carrots and getting rid of the sticks. Um, and that's really, I think, probably the biggest issue at this point in time. I don't see an issue of consumers not wanting or not being interested in purchasing electric vehicles. I think a lot of that today comes down to the overall cost of an EV, right? Mm -hmm. a, a, a traditional full battery electric vehicle, 30 to 40% of the cost of the vehicle is the battery itself. Yeah. So if you can basically find ways to make the battery more energy dense, lower quality, not lower quality raw materials, but lower cost raw materials, that pulls down the cost of the car. And then all of a sudden you're at parity from a total cost of ownership basis with an internal combustion engine car and then you're off to the races. So I'm really, I'm obviously bullish today, but I'm really interested to see what happens from say 2025 onwards in this in this space. Which jurisdiction geography do you think will emerge as the dominant EV uh, player in the world in over, over the next five years or so? Yeah, well, I think, look, China and the European Union are really battling for dominance right now. I think North America is, is quite frankly, in third place, and it's a distant third place. That doesn't mean that it's always going to be this way. But, uh, you know, the Chinese are, quite frankly, pretty far ahead of just about anybody else from a supply chain perspective. I mean, when you think about how much of the supply chain they own, whether or not it's with lithium or nickel or rare earth elements, you know, it took them 20 years to build this up, and it's not going to change overnight. So I would look for real electric vehicle growth in terms of just demand for the EVs, but also demand for the metals from China, obviously. I mean, I think that's a no-brainer. But, you know, when you look at what's happening in the European Union and their focus on building a circular EV supply chain, I'm pretty optimistic about what I see happening over there as well. But again... It sounds to me like EV is kind of, well, lithium is kind of evolving into what crude oil was 50 years ago. We saw what happened with the OPEC oil crisis when, when, uh, when supply was cut off. Uh, let's talk yeah. about geopolitics then. Could, could any sort of similar situation happen in the future involving EV, uh, lithium supply chains around the world when maybe the, the market is cornered or maybe cut off and we see a huge scramble to reassert um, the supply chain back into uh, normalcy? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, there have been banks and other other you know companies that have talked about lithium as the new oil. I'm not sure about that. That uh, there are a lot of differences in the markets, whether or not it's size or or you know any number of of issues. How ubiquitous, for example, oil is in the global economy relative to lithium. So I wouldn't quite go that far. But you know, look, I. The good thing about lithium is that, again, it's not rare. It's found just about everywhere in the ground. Um, most of the supply chain, again, from the refining perspective, um, is located in Asia and is located in China. And that sort of makes sense because the cost of labor is lower over there. And that's where a big market is. Um, I think lithium will always remain an oligopoly, although you will see some new producers uh, enter the space out over the next few years, but I don't really see it becoming a cartel in the same way that, that OPEC is. Well, finally, let's talk about the price of lithium. Do you think, uh, do you think what, what are the major changes you see going forward? You said the demand's going to grow by 20% year over year. Uh, if you factor in the supply growth as well, what's going to happen to the price? Well, you know, lithium pricing for the battery quality chemicals has at least doubled over the last uh, 12 months or so from its mid COVID lows. Um, I think the question and, you know, look, that's very confusing for investors, because when you take, for example, the price of lithium carbonate today, which is around 15, maybe 15 and a half thousand tons um, or fifteen thousand dollars, I should say, per ton. And you overlay that over the existing lithium cost curve, the entire lithium cost curve today would be economic. And so that's confusing. My view is that longer term battery quality material is going to settle into a range between, say, twelve to thirteen thousand dollars a ton, because I think that allows not just the existing producers to expand capacity comfortably and, ma and manage their margins, but yeah. also allows for some other near term producers that have, say, you know, second second tier uh, assets, if you will, maybe not world class, but very close to get into production and, and generate a healthy margin and um, allow everybody along the supply chain to actually generate a healthy margin as well. So, you know, that doesn't mean that we're headed for a huge fall in the lithium market or the battery metals markets, but I do see longer term a sustainable price of, say, twelve to thirteen thousand dollars a ton. Yeah, that's that's what I thought. I, I would I would assume that the. Um big auto auto manufacturers don't want lithium prices to go up that much it would like you said hurt their margins it's not like petroleum where petroleum is a huge input cost for producing cars it's uh um uh, lithium is different and so uh, they would probably try to stabilize the price somehow where at least where at least if they can't do that uh they would probably try to thrift maybe uh find alternatives use less of it in their batteries yep and we that's again that, we yeah. this is you're absolutely right. And that has, again, been a huge area of focus in the lithium ion supply chain is, you know, we don't think we being the industry in general, don't think that there's a really viable alternative to lithium, at least not for mobility. If you want to talk about broader, longer term energy storage, I mean, vanadium makes an awful lot of sense, a lot more sense. But again, probably a separate conversation. But yet, you know, there really is no way that I think engineers have found thus far, battery engineers have found to use less lithium and increase that energy density. And that's the name of the game. Again, there are a number of different um, battery chemistry formats, lithium iron phosphate, nickel cobalt manganese, et cetera, et cetera. And they all have their own pros and cons. But again, the one constant across the supply chain is that you're going to use just about the same amount of lithium per battery, per EV. There's really just no way around it. And so it's an enormous challenge for the industry going forward. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. And I look forward to having you back again. Absolutely. Thank you, David. Thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm David Lin. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow me on Twitter at DavidLin underscore TV.